Since prehistoric times, humans have had an enduring curiosity to understand what lie beyond. What is over that next ridge? What is beyond that grove of trees? What is at the bottom of that waterfall? What land is on the opposite side of that ocean? This curiosity and the resulting exploration tested humanity in ways that required innovation. The invention of the wheel provided the means to build wagons to transport material goods over land across large distances. The invention of the canoe permitted the ability to navigate river channels. Barges allowed merchants to transport goods on rivers and through man-made canals. And ships were built that were capable to travel the oceans and eventually circumnavigate the world. Throughout this time, navigators used the stars and the sun as a means to guide their path, determine their position on Earth, predict changes in the seasons, and track the progress of time. As civilization took hold, innovation's pace accelerated at a tremendous rate. Wealth, mostly under the control of large nation-states, was the dominant force driving innovation and exploration. War bought, brought on additional needs for expansion and control of territory, and therefore the need for larger and more capable ships. Eventually, these sail ships were capable of sailing the oceans of the world, and merchant ships soon realized the potential for a global commerce exchanging goods from throughout the globe. Commerce brought about the need for peace, as the trade industry would suffer in wartime. In the Great War, now known as World War I, very simple versions of the airplane were used as a way to spy on the enemy and drop small explosives and strafe trenches filled with troops. By the end of the war, strategic and specialized airplanes were starting to be used. Much like the historic merchants using sail ships long ago, private industry saw a huge potential in this wartime technology. In 1919, a wealthy hotel owner, Raymond Ortigue, saw the huge potential for the airplane and decided to use his considerable wealth to provide an incentive prize to help to push the technology forward. As a result, he decided to establish the Raymond Ortigue Prize, a $25,000 prize for the first non-stop flight between New York and Paris. Over the following years, airplane technology grew rapidly, leading to the Air Commerce Act in 1926 that provided the certification and licensing of private pilots and the creation of a new private commercial aeronautics industry. On April 31, 1927, an historic flight by Captain Charles Lindbergh piloted the Spirit of St. Louis, took off from New York, traveled 5,809 kilometers, crossing the Atlantic, and landed in Paris. This feat of technological wonder was unthinkable just 24 years earlier when Wilbur and Orville Wright marked history with the first powered flight in an airplane, traveling a mere 552 feet. By 1930s, the commercial airline industry was conducting transatlantic flights with passenger air travel in seaplanes, such as the Yankee Clipper, in 1939. These enormous strides in commercial flight provided the means to travel for non-military, private citizens for the price of a ticket. None of this could have been possible without the amazing innovation sparked by the privatization of the aeronautics industry and the commercialization of flight by the airline industry. World War II brought about additional need for advanced airplane technology, and the resulting airplane designs now included fighters, bombers, troop transport, cargo aircraft, refueling airplanes, spy planes, and more. The largest step, of course, was the invention of the jet engine by the Nazi Germany and later by the Allied forces. This new engine design provided significantly faster speeds. Airplane flight distances, also carrying capacities, increased dramatically. 
providing the ability to carry significant cargo payloads across large distances. Once again, commercial airlines saw an opportunity for commercialization of this wartime technology. Rapid development took place, and by the late 1940s and early 1950s, the commercial aeronautics industry had produced the first successful jet airliner, the Boeing 707. The new, large middle class in the increasingly more industrial United States and European economies adopted the capabilities of this extremely fast and reliable mode of travel. Within just a few years, by 1969, the fastest commercial aircraft of all time, the Concorde, was produced, flying an astonishing 1,354 miles per hour, or Mach 2.04, with up to 128 passengers on board, it could complete a transatlantic flight in around four hours. Also during World War II, a new era was beginning in the form of the aerospace industry. During World War II, Nazi Germany, under the guidance of Chief Engineer Werner von Braun, produced the Vengeance I and Vengeance II rockets. These rockets were unmanned vehicles with explosives, the predecessors of modern-day guided missiles. Germany used these V-1 and V-2 rockets as a way to strike terror in Allied-held cities, launching rockets from well behind Nazi-controlled territory without notice. In the end, these rockets did not account for a sizable percentage of the overall death and destruction caused by World War II but did represent a colossal change in the ways and means by which warfare would progress until modern times. As the war came to a close, and the United States and the former Soviet Union entered into Nazi-occupied territory, they systematically rounded up scientists and technology related with the Nazi war machine, including the rocket scientists, technology, and entire fully capable V-1 and V-2 rockets. After the war, much with the help of former Nazi regime scientists, the United States and Russia continued to compete against one another. Starting in 1946, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, experimented with rocket-powered airplanes such as the Bell, One, Bell X-1 and pushed the boundaries of jet-powered supersonic flight. In 1957-58, the International Geophysical Year, a challenge was placed to launch an artificial satellite. Shortly after this challenge was proposed, the Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1, into orbit, and the space race had begun. On July 29, 1958, the United States formed the National Aeronautics and Space Agency, out of the former NACA agency. Early efforts by NASA lagged significantly behind the Soviet Union. In its earliest days, the space race was less an attempt to reach space and more a way of providing evidence of the capability of intercontinental ballistic missile technologies, or ICBMs. These missiles were capable of launching and delivering nuclear warheads from land-based and sea-based platforms from anywhere in the world to any other place in the world. This capability, although once again a result of wartime technology, sparked the potential for use of this technology for exploration. On September 12, 1962, John F. Kennedy, on the campus of Rice University in Houston, Texas, provided one of the most famous speeches of all time. The speech, which is now known as the We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, continued to present President Kennedy's vision for a new era in a modern space flight and space exploration. He set a goal to put a man on the moon by the next decade, and to do this because, quote, that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Kennedy understood the power of having a goal a challenge to bring out the best in humanity. The same sense of curiosity that drove early humans to explore what was over that next ridge 
what was behind that grove of trees, what was at the bottom of that waterfall or across that ocean, also drove us to explore our closest celestial neighbor, the moon. Following President Kennedy's speech, the nation got behind the idea full force. And on July 20th, 1969, NASA landed the first man, Neil Armstrong, on the moon. Fortunately, unfortunately, President Kennedy did not have the opportunity to witness the goal he set forth due to his assassination on November 22nd, 1963. The Apollo program lasted a total of 17 missions and resulted in six successful landings on the moon. Twelve men walked on the surface. The inspiration of the Apollo program had run its course. The nation was wary of large costs of the mission and the space race had been won symbolically in the hearts and minds of the general public. NASA's funding, public interest, and mission goals waned in the years post-Apollo. The space program refocused on low Earth orbit missions using the space shuttle to build the International Space Station. The ISS, now fully constructed, continues to operate to this day. The space shuttle flew a total of 135 flights, with two unfortunate accidents, STS-51L with the loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger and crew, 76, 73 seconds into launch, and STS-107, the Space Shuttle Columbia, which disintegrated upon re-entry, loss of both the vehicle and crew. The Space Shuttle program officially ended with the last flight of the Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2011. Unmanned NASA programs continued to explore the solar system, traveling through the solar system with robotic probes, orbiters, landers, and rovers. NASA science continued to explore our own Earth as well as Earth-facing satellites to understand Earth's weather patterns, sea surface temperature, sea ice extent, climate, forest fires, rainforest canopy densities, crop yields from farm fields, and ancient ruins, just to name a few. Through this remote sensing, NASA uncovered unexpected concerns of an Earth undergoing change. Our climate was changing rapidly, and the warming of our planet through the use of carbon emitting processes, primarily our use of fossil fuels. NASA also launched numerous space-based telescopes. These telescopes were used to study the depths of our universe. The now famous Hubble Space Telescope, deployed by the Space Shuttle, has provided awe-inspiring images of our cosmos that have inspired a new generation's interest in space science. NASA's array of space telescopes look into the depths of the each type of light in the electromagnetic spectrum, providing an understanding of our universe unmatched in the history of astronomy. Today's scientists can get nearly instantaneous connection to NASA's shared data resources to conduct research on a broad array of topics. This open source data warehouse is available for all NASA collected scientific data and can be accessed by anyone with an internet connection. This innovation has leveled the playing field of science. No longer are scientists required to have direct contact with their observatories. NASA scientists and scientists all over the world can collaborate on research together, and the study of astronomy has advanced at a pace not ever seen before in the history of science. After the retiring of the space shuttle, NASA had no means by which to get humans and cargo to the newly built International Space Station. In order to not leave the ISS vacant from astronauts, the decision was made to start a cooperation with the program of the Russian Space Organization, or Roscosmos, to launch Americans to the ISS on their Soyuz rocket. This was to be a temporary situation for NASA until the Ares rocket, now known as the Space Launch System, SLS, and Orion spacecraft was ready. 
the Ares, or SLS, was slotted to take the United States back to the moon and eventually to Mars. Unfortunately, the Ares, or SLS, program has experienced significant delays, complete changes in the program, cost overruns, and has not produced a spacecraft to date. After nearly a decade of spaceflight delays, a new chapter in our history is upon us. Only one year after the retiring of the space shuttle, NASA decided to start a public-private partnership through the creation of the commercial, commercial space flight program. The commercial space flight industry started to make resupply missions to the ISS, as well as launch U.S. government satellites. These early missions sparked interest in the private sector, and almost immediately, multiple startup rocket companies were born. Today, NASA has doubled down on the commercial spaceflight industry with the addition of the Commercial Crew Program. The Commercial Crew Program is planned to take over the role of launching U.S. astronauts to the ISS from U.S. soil. This marks a turning point in history. For the first time ever, human spaceflight will be put a for-profit industry. Already, these rockets have advanced significantly. The primary difference is in their reusability of the rockets. Rather than the single-use model employed by NASA for all spacecraft, with the exception of the partially reusable space shuttle, a second major difference in these rockets also is their ability for vertical takeoff and landing. As demonstrated by both SpaceX, Falcon 9 rocket, and the Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket. At this point, two companies have made the cut for the first round of the commercial crew program, SpaceX and Boeing. SpaceX's Dragon 2, or Crew Dragon, has conducted the first test of Demo-1 in the spacecraft and will conduct additional rides for astronauts as early as July 2019. The next generation of space flight beyond Earth orbit is also starting to take hold. NASA, as well as the commercial programs, have plans to launch space-based internet networks, rovers to the moon, asteroid mining companies to utilize space-based resources such as water, iron, and platinum group metals, space tourism industries, and even the colonization of the planet Mars. If history is any indication, we are on the cusp of a new era where the boundless curiosity and enthusiasm for exploration of humanity will once again flourish on a new ocean as we set sail in the open seas of interplanetary space.